Okay, so get GMO greetings, I say. We thank everybody for tuning in to this special live. For those who are unaware of our channel, unaware of the work, I am Ojirafo Kwesi Rodney Mbata Akam. Ojirafo of Akwamu Mind, Maruka Tifimbu, the Akwamu Nation in North America within Ojira Mind, the purified nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people, African Black people in the Western Hemisphere. So we have published a number of books, 31 books to date, dealing with various aspects of Afurakani, Afurakani, meaning African ancestral religion, culture, nation building, restoration, spirituality, revolution, resolution, and so forth. When we talk about specific aspects of ancestral religion and cosmology, we always relate that not only to our spiritual cultivation individually as a group with regard to Afurakani, Afurakani people, African Black people, but also communally and dealing with nation building, restoration. You saw in the title, we talk about nationism, amanie or nationism, the purification of nationalism, an approach to nation building, restoration rooted in our ancestral religious practice, culture, cosmology. So this is an extension of that, it's an expression of that. We want to get into the nature and function of the male divinity, Hapi, the female divinity, Merit, and Hapi and Merit are the male and female forces that animate the river um, on earth, of course, the river of blood in your body is Afurakani, Afurakani people, that river of energy in your body that feeds all of the cells in the body and so forth, the river of stars in the sky called the Great Hop and so forth. We want to talk about that cosmology uh, as it relates to us spiritually with regard to spiritual cultivation, as well as how it relates to us with regard to us as a nation, Afurakani, Afurakani people. So. Let's go out of this right quick. Okay. Okay, so this is one of the documents that we um, go through and we put forward for our annual Hapi Meri retreat. We have a training cultural and ritual retreat that takes place every February. Um, this year is going to be February 18th through the 20th. It is on Edisto Island. And let's just post that real quick so you can see it on the website. This is one of the documents that we go through, the information we touch on at the retreat. One second. Okay, so this is our Happy Metary page on our website. And we, on Edisto Island in South Carolina, that is one of the Gullah Sea Islands. That's one of the places where our people, of course, were taken during the enslavement era, but also one of the places where some of our ancestresses and ancestors fought against the whites and offspring, freed themselves from enslavement, established independent sovereign settlements and defended those settlements and waged war until we forced the end of enslavement. They were one of the groups, that group in that specific region, one of the groups of Afurakani, Afurakani people who waged war against the whites in our spring to participate in that overall effort to force the end of enslavement in the Western Hemisphere. So it's a sacred ancestral land for us. We go to Edisto Island this, this weekend, February 18th through the 20th, that particular weekend. 
um, this year. It's usually mid-February, so around February 16th, 17th, 18th, this particular weekend. Um, for this year coming up, February 18th through the 20th, and we have training, cultural, ritual, and so forth. So, and the document that we're about to go over tonight is one of the documents that we touch on as well as other things in the retreat. So let's get back. But first let's look at the information that we put forward. The imagery that we put forward that you saw for the broadcast. So, of course, this is Hapi, the male divinity. We have Merit, the female divinity. And one of the things that we focus on, that many do not focus on, is the balance of male and female. That starts off with the balance of Amen and Amenet, the great father and the great mother supreme being. Amen is the great father. Amenet is the great mother. We have Ra, who's the creator. Ra'et, who is the creatress. We have Ma'al, who's the male deity of divine law and balance. Ma'at, who's the female divinity of divine law and balance. So very often when our people are reading about ancient Kemetas, studying certain things, and they read things written by Europeans and so forth, they follow along with what Europeans talk about. That has to do with cosmology, therefore not having a firm understanding of what the cosmology is about, but also the things that the Europeans neglect we tend to neglect as well. If Europeans focus on Amen, sometimes called Amen Ra the great God, then we tend to focus on that. They totally dismiss Amenet, the great mother. If they focus on Ra the creator, they don't focus on Ra'et, then that's an imbalance coming from them. That has nothing to do with us. When they focus on Hapi, the male divinity that animates the river, but they don't focus as much or equally on Merit, the female divinity that animates the river, then that shows the imbalance spiritually, culturally, and so forth. We incorporate that imbalance and then we perpetuate it when we begin to teach about our culture, but we're teaching like Europeans. We don't even seek to look for the balance because we've been conditioned or controlled, misinformed by Europeans. So we deal with balance from the beginning. This is Hapi, this is Mary. Now, we're going to go back to our other website, web page, quickly. Just to give you a quick rundown. This is the page on our website dealing with our books. These are the 31 books we've published, but just so you can see some evidence of what we're talking about really quickly. This is our book in Yonkumpon, in Yonkumpon, Ra and Ra'et. In this book, we're showing that Ra the Creator and Ra'et the Creatress and ancient Kemet are the same divinities in Yonkumpon and in Yonkumpon in our Khan culture. What's important is many people have seen images of Ra the Creator, but they haven't seen Ra'et the Creatress. They together are the great spirit that animate all of creation, all of the created universe. They are the Creator and Creatress, and they are functionaries subordinate to and supportive of and functionaries of the Supreme Being, Amen and Amenet. Now, this is one of the many images. This is Amen, the great male divinity, Supreme Being, but this is Amenet, the great mother. Amen and Amenet are seated together when you look at the oldest religious texts, compositions yet unearthed in the world, which are the Meru texts or so-called pyramid texts, talking about cosmology and divinities, there are no texts dealing with religious compositions that are older than the Meru or pyramid texts, yet unearthed in the world. And in those oldest texts, you will find Amen and Amenet mentioned together as compliments. That's always been the case. So. Amen and Amen are the great being, the supreme being, two halves of a divine whole. 
And then you have Ra and Ra at the creator and create dress who proceed from Amen and Amenet and go out and create the world. Just as you are a great being, and if you look at yourself on the microcosmic level, the Afurakani man is an emanation of our man on the microcosmic level. The Afurakani or African black woman is an emanation of Amenet on the microcosmic level. So that reflection you see within yourself. You're a great being. If you're an Afurakani man, you're an emanation of our man. The life force energy within you that animates you, that fills up your entire being, that you direct through your reproductive apparatus to go out and create a child and so forth, that is your life force energy, your procreative force, that is your raw force. You as the great being direct your raw force to go out and create. As an Afuraikaidi woman, an African black woman, you're an emanation of Amenet on the microcosmic level and your divine living energy, your life force energy, your procreative power is your Ra'et force. And you like Amenet directs Ra'et to go out and create. That's the same process. So the great being is Amen and Amenet. The spirit is Ra and Ra'et, who are functionaries of the Supreme Being. So the creator and creatress are literally grandchildren of the Supreme Being. So we go into that cosmology in this book, but we also just wanted to show um, that we deal with that balance across the board now. Okay, so now we get to Hapi and Merit. The Nayar, which is the term which was corrupted into Nayal or Nile, longest river in the world. And when you look in ancient Kemet, you will find that it very rarely rains in ancient Kemet. The entire economy of the country was dependent on the inundation of the river. So every year at the same time, and it was inaugurated by the moving into position of the star system Sapatit, and that star later came to be called Sirius and Sothis by the Greeks and so forth. It is called Sapatit by our people in ancient Kemet. It's, a, it's the brightest star in the sky. It is the sanctuary of the female divinity are set and are set when that star moves in position, her spiritual force is animating that orb that is a shrine for her energy on the stellar realm and so forth. Just like Osar, misnomer Osiris, but Osar on the stellar realm, his sanctuary is called Sa or Sahu. The whites in our spring call that Orion, but we call this Sa or Sahu. So Sa. And Sapatit is Osar and Aset, misnomered Osiris and Isis, but Osar and Aset operating in their shrines in the stellar region. Stellar, solar, lunar, earthly, in your body on every level of creation, there are shrines for these different divinities. In the stellar region, Sa and Sapatit, so called Orion and Sirius. But when that star moves into position, that shrine moves into position and transmits our set's energy through that stellar orb and its energy penetrates our solar system and, and, and engulfs the energy of earth and so forth. That is the inauguration of the rising of the Nile River. They say it's the night of the drop, the divine teardrop from the eye, they will call the star the eye of rod and so forth, animated by our set. The teardrop falls from the eye, falls into the river and then the river is swells. So every year at the same time, the, the water begins to swell, it begins to flood. And over a number of months, it floods hundreds of miles of the country, as you can see. So you see the river here, you know, moving through the landscape. And then you see the flood. Kemet was called Ta Meri, the land of Meri, the inundation, the land that becomes inundated or buried under the water for months. And then when the water begins to recede after a number of months, 
They have that black soil that was carried from the south and deposited along the banks of the river. You start seeing that fertile black soil, that black silt. Once the waters begin to recede, all of that black silt is there in abundance. And when people see the black silt that was deposited on the banks of the river, when the water recedes, then they go out and plant their crops in that black silt. And then months later, they have abundance. So that was the cycle. It wasn't raining in Kemet. Kemet is a very different kind of terrain. You have the fertile uh, Nile Valley, Hopi Valley. Right outside of that is stark desert. And when we travel to Kemet, and we, we have a trip coming up in May, if you would like to join us on that tour, you can. Um, you will see when we're driving along the Nile River, driving along Hapi, driving along Merit, you'll see it's very lush, greenery, you know, fertile, and so forth. But then right outside the road, you have stark desert that goes for miles. So it's a very um, unique area in the world. So longest river of the world, every year at a certain point, the land begins to be flooded, inundated. Once the waters recede, now there's fertility and people can plant their crops. This is another image of the fertile aspect of the river. Now. First, we'll look at Hop. So the name of the divinity is Hop. He's called Hop. He's also called Hapi. In this particular dictionary of the Medutu, the so-called hieroglyphs and so forth, but the term is Medut Toro. Mm toro, misnomer netter, but mm toro, as it's pronounced in the Akan language today, mm toro means deity. So medut are the symbols that manifest as words of the mm toro, the divinity. They're the divine words, medut mm toro. The Greek term is hieroglyphs, but we say the medut or medutu, plural. So hop or hapi, you have different spellings of the name. Sometimes it's hop, sometimes it's pronounced hapi. So of course the river Nile, Nile flood and so forth, all these different titles. This image is from um, the temple of Apet Asetu, which is called Karnak. When we visit Kemet, you will see that, that particular image. It is on the um, throne of a colossal statue of Ramesu II, misnomer Ramses II. That's very famous and well-known, you know, relief. If we look at the nature of the name, then you get some understanding of the function of the divinity. Hep, to move slowly, to slink along, to advance cautiously, to advance, to travel, to go about, advance, progress, a course, and so forth. Now, now we have the divinity Merit. And we have different images of her, of course. Here you see her side by side. So you have Merit, the goddess of the inundation. Merti, meaning the dual. Merit, two goddesses of the inundation, the southern and northern. There are, Merit is a twin divinity. There are two of them, just like identical twins. There's an expansive and contractive. That there's the northern Merit, Merit Met, and the southern Merit, Merit Shema, Shema meaning south or southern. So you see them side by side right here. Right here, you see the plant of the south. So that's Merit of the south, Merit Shema. And Side by side, she has on her head the plan of the north, that's Merit Met. In the same fashion, there are two Hapi divinities. The spiritual force is a twin force. There's Meri, a Hapi of the south and Hapi of the north. Northern Kemet, Southern Kemet. This is Hapi of the south, and you see him wearing the plant, the sacred plant totem of the south, the sedge plant the Nekeb plant and so forth. And then you see Hop of the North. He's wearing the 
watch plant, which is the papyrus, the sacred plant totem of the North. These are twin divinities. You also see that Hopi is typically shown with a fat belly, sagging chest and so forth, like an overweight individual. That's because every year when the river swells, in the same fashion, the spiritual force that animates the rivers rep is representing and referencing the fact that at a certain time of the year, the rivers that's moving through its normal course swells and overruns the entire country. So Hapi becomes, he swells or gets big and so forth, and he floods the entire country. Now, So you have these two divinities, Merida of the South, Merida of the North, Hopi of the South, Hopi of the North. Now, there's a direct relationship between nation building, these two divinities, and we'll also see how they're connected to us spiritually. But first, we want to look at this notion of nation building in relationship to these divinities. Now, when we talk about the river moving across the land and so forth, it is the one bringing abundance, the entire economy of the people was dependent on the flood of the river. If the river did not flood, then people would go, they would starve. There's a text in Kemet called the seven years famine. And it talks about for seven years, the river did not rise at its normal flooding you know, height and people were starving and suffering and so forth. And the Per A, the king sent one of his representatives to the South to find out what was happening. They consulted the shrines of the divinities. They consulted the deities and so forth. And one of the divinities said that since the practice of the tradition was falling you know, into you know, negligence, certain people weren't upkeeping the shrine. They weren't engaged in ritual incantation. They weren't aligning themselves with the divinities. Then that was the reason why the river didn't swell. When they recommitted themselves to engaging the religious practices, invoking the divinities, purifying the shrines, you know, um, establishing the shrines, expanding the shrine space and so forth, and people got back on track with practicing ancestral religion, then the divinity Kunwimu declared that he would allow the river to, you know, swell once again, and abundance would return to the land. So if people, you know, if the river did not swell, if there was no inundation, not at the right height, then the entire country would suffer economically. Now, now we're going to go into a specific corroboration of this relationship between the divinities and nation building. Just give me one second. All right. Okay, so every year around the summer solstice in June, we have our annual Ojiramain conference, Ojiramain Afashe, which is the Ojiramain conference. Ojiramain means the purified Ojira, Omain nation in the Western hemisphere. That's the title that we use to designate all Afurakani, Afurakani people, African black people in the Western hemisphere. We're the purified nation, those who return to our culture and so forth, and we are moving forward dealing with Amaniye or nationism, as we show in the flyer here. Afurakani, Afurakani, African Black nationism, the purification of nationalism. It is an approach to nation building, restoration rooted in our ancestral religious values. So we have a different approach than just secular nationalism, you know, secular pan Africanism and so forth. We have to approach nation building rooted in our ancestral religious values, not embracing Euro Eurocentric or European approaches to nation building like socialism, semi-socialism, scientific socialism, none of that foolishness. We have our own culture. We can identify every need and address every need and fulfill every need we have as a people, as a nation within our own culture. So, but we give definitions in the text, we talk about jida and akam means purification to purify. 
Jidai and Enchi Kemet means purification to purify and so forth. But we also have this term. The term mine, what mine new in ancient Kemet means a town or a city. It also means the land of the setting sun, the west. So Ojira Mine means the purified Ojira or mine, nation, town, city, polity. But mine also means the land of the west, the setting sun. We are the purified nation, Ojira Mine, in the land of the west. Mine, the land of the setting sun, we are the extreme west of Afuraka, Afurakai. So we utilize that terminology. But it goes a little bit further. And this gets into spirituality and nation building and the synchronicity between the two. In the hieroglyphic dictionary, you will see that the term, as we just saw, mine, also written mainu, means a town or a city, meaning a polity, a political structure, a political entity. We already saw mine, also pronounced mainu, is spelled differently in different texts. Mine or mainu means the west, the land of the setting sun. But mine also means to twist, to turn around, curved, bow shape, but to twist, to turn. So the same word for a nation or a polity or a political entity, a group of people working together for a common cause, mine or my new, that same word is defined as to twist or turn. That's in the language of ancient Kemet. Now, when you look in the Akan language, the term or mine, a town, the inhabitants of a town as a political body, a community. A body, the body of inhabitants of a country united under the same government, a nation, tribe, people, state. So for example, people have heard of the Asante people or Ashanti people, one of the large Akan ethnic groups. As a nation, instead of saying Asante nation, they say Asante mine, meaning the Omain, the nation of the Asante people, Asante Man. When you heard me say Akwamu Man, Amaruka, Itifimu, that is the Akwamu Oman, Akwamu Man, the Akwamu nation in North America. So Akwamu people are a subgroup of the Akan people. You have the Asante, which is a large group, millions of Asante people, that's a subgroup of the Akan. You have the Fanti people, they are a subgroup of the Akan. There are millions of Fanti people. You have the Akwamu, who are a subgroup of the Akan. There are a couple of million Akwamu people and so forth. So Akwamu nation is Akwamu mine. The Fanti nation is Fanti mine. The Asante nation is Asante mine and so forth. But the word is Omai, nation, body of inhabitants of a country, a nation and so forth. But the same word Omai or the root mind, meaning a nation, a polity, a political body, and so forth, is also defined in the Akan language, <clears throat> mind, to turn or go aside, to turn in somewhere from the way or journey. So we just saw that mind means to twist or to turn in ancient Kemet. Mind also means a nation, a polity, a political entity. Mind means to twist or turn aside or turn into somewhere in the Akan language. Or mind means a nation. A polity. Now, where does that come from cosmologically, and how is that related to Hapi and Merit being two divinities that we are totally dependent upon with regard to nation building? Now, let's go back out. So, when you're talking about the flooding of the land, the river is the major artery or vein within the country. And the river carries the black silt, and that is the black silt that has the capacity once you know uh, seeds are planted and so forth for crops to come forth in abundance. The river in the body are the arteries and the veins.
And these are the shrines of Hapi and Merit in the Bible. Just like the major rivers on earth are shrines of Hapi and Merit, they are the spiritual force that animates the river. So if you go to Kemet and you stood inside of the river, of course, that's the body of water, but the spiritual force on the expansive side that animates the river is the male divinity Hapi, Hapi Met in the north, and then Hapi Reset, Hapi in the south. The uh, feminine force, the contractive force that is animating the river is Merit, and there's Merit Met, the female divinity that animates the northern branch of the river, and then Merit Shema, the female divinity who animates the southern branch of the river. Inside your body, the arteries and the veins, these are the shrines of Hapi and Merit. So that same spiritual force that's animating the river on earth is the same spiritual force that's animating the river of blood in your body. Now, so there's also a Hap Ur, meaning the great Hap, the great Nile in the sky, that's the river of stars in the sky and so forth. This is a satellite image of the river. And you can see the river twisting and turning and moving and coursing about into the north. Of course, this is a map showing the rivers once as well. Now, when you look at the um, when you look at the cosmology, you'll begin to understand why they have these titles, Hapi and Meri. Now, hold on a second now. If you look at the circulatory system, the arteries, the blood vessels that moves blood away from the heart. So the blood is sent from the heart, carries the uh, nutrients all throughout the body. That's what the arteries do, and they're a little bit bigger and a little bit more robust and so forth, and they push you know, the blood away from the heart into the various parts of the body. Then you have the veins, the blood vessel that moves blood towards the heart. So from the left side of the heart, you know, the, the blood is sent out, floods the entire body and so forth, and then the veins bring back the deoxygenated blood back to the right side of the heart. Once it gets to the right side of the heart, it goes to the heart-lung complex. The lungs fire the blood up, reoxygenate the blood, purify the blood, and so forth. Once it's purified through that lung process, then it's sent back into the um, right, the or uh, the left atrium, and so forth of the heart, and then it's sent out through the left ventricle, and then it goes back through that system. So, the left side of the heart, the arteries send the blood away from the heart, and the veins bring the and the blood is oxygenated, fired up and so forth. And then the veins capture the blood and carry it back to the right side of the heart for purification. This is what's happening. Now let's look at these definitions. So hop to move slowly to slink along to advance cautiously to advance to travel to go about so the blood is being sent away from the heart is moving cautiously is slinking moving moving slowly cautiously advancing cautiously to go forth to embrace to hug to take to the breast and so forth is moving through you know all the different parts of the body the blood is being released bathing the cells, the cells receive that oxygen, that fire is in the oxygen and so forth. They are fired up, they're nourished, they're, you know, um, impacted in a great degree by the blood that's sent by the divinity hop. And he's coursing along throughout the body. Then one of the definitions of merit or merit, band, bandage, girdle, filet, bundles of clothes, a festival, gladness. So when you see Merit, and let's look at this image of Merit. Now, 
And you see her engage in ritual invocation. Very often you see the basket she has and they talk about Mary with the basket. They'll say she's the one that brings the festival. She's a songstress and so forth. Both Mary, Mary Shema, Mary Matt, they have the basket and they carry and capture the harvest. And once they capture the harvest, then people are fed by the harvest. And then of course those foods and so forth are depleted, but there's a time for merriment to make merry. When you talk about merry and merriment, that comes directly from the name of the divinity. When she captures the blood and carries it back to the heart and so forth, she's the one that's harvesting everything that took place. Hapi is sending the energy out to make things happen and so forth and feed the people and nourish the people, nourish the cells and everything. And then Mary captures that harvest and distributes it and returns things back to the heart. So when you hear the term Hapi and Mary, Hapi is the origin of the term happy. When the flood comes, then the people know that there's gonna be abundance throughout the land. If the flood does not come, if the flood doesn't rise to its normal height, then there's gonna be famine throughout the land. But if the flood rises and they see Hapi has risen to his normal height, then the people know for sure that there's gonna be a, an abundant crop that year, a bumper crop that year and so forth, and people become Hapi or happy. And when the crop comes and it fully flowers and the fruits and so forth, the produce, produce comes forward and it falls off the vines and trees and so forth and it's collected in the baskets and carried throughout you know, the population, the people feed from that, the harvest takes place, then that is Mary. She's bringing that harvest and people deplete that harvest through consumption and they make Mary. So happy and Mary is the origin of happy and Mary, M-E-R-R-Y. But of course, it's also the origin of the term When you look at the term festival and gladness, but you also have the term meri, a band, bandage, girdle, fillet. It's talking about binding or banding something together. When you take the harvest, you consume the fruits and so forth, the vitamins, minerals, and so forth, get into the cells and bind themselves. There's a fusion that takes place, the vitamins, minerals that you need to strengthen yourself, edify yourself, and also empower you to move forward and function in the world. That's a binding that takes place. So when Mary comes with the harvest and you feed off of the harvest, that's a fusion, that's a binding. That's when we talk about the bonds or you know ties of marriage to marry and so forth. That means you fuse together with the individual who is your complement. That is the origin of the term marry in the context of binding, fusion together, tying the quote unquote not binding together. The word for marriage is also the word for binding, tying the knot. That's because meri is a bandage, girdle, fillet, band, and so forth, bundles, binding, binding together. That's the name of the divinity. But mer, meri, also a festival, mer, merit, gladness. That's because the nature of that divinity, her functioning in the world, and also her shrines in your body, that has to do with gladness, merit, happiness, because you're fulfilled, because the harvest has come, and you can feed off of the harvest and purify yourself, edify yourself, strengthen yourself, and so forth. And you also see that aspect of hop or hapi, to embrace, to hug, to take the breast, and so forth. That's once again dealing with fusion as well now. So when you look at the circulatory system, it also shows that the two shrines, northern and southern of the divinities is also manifest in the body. So you have the veins, as we talked about, you have the superior vena cava, inferior vena cava. And what you're talking about 
the superior and inferior, you have the veins and the arteries above the heart. You have the veins and the arteries below the heart. The superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, and then you have the superior and inferior arteries and so forth. And when we go back up and look at the original piece, So you have the arteries above that central organ, the arteries and veins above, above the central organ, the arteries and veins below the central organ. That's manifest in the expression of the divinities, merit of happy of the South, happy of the North. Merit of the South, merit of the North. Merit the veins above the heart, merit the veins below the heart. Happy the arteries above the heart, happy the arteries below the heart. So we have that in the cosmology. It's directly related to our biology and so forth. Now, so when you see this particular image and then you look at the map here and you see the different cities. Now, if you're moving along the river, moving along that path of the river, and you come across a specific group, a grouping, there are a group of people who are working along together in a unified fashion. When we go to ancient Kemet, and for example, when we fly from Cairo to Aswan, and then we uh, get in the bus and we drive from Aswan further south into Kanit, into Nubia, and go to the Temple of Ramesu, the second in Nefertari in Nubit or Nubia. We're driving along the road and so forth. You'll see we're driving through the Nubian desert. You see the different, you know, tumuli and so forth, the different rock structures and so forth. We sail along the river um, from the south, from Kanit, from Nubia all the way up to the north and so forth. You see, you're moving through for a while, you be 30 minutes, 40 minutes and so forth that you're moving along and you're just seeing the river and the land and so forth. And then all of a sudden you see a group of individuals, a polity, a political structure, a group of individuals, they're all working together for a common cause. So you're going along a path and then when you turn off, there's a group of individuals working together. And you get back on the road and you go further, then you turn off and you see a group of individuals working together. And let's just, to refresh the memory and pull the linguistics and the cosmology back together. We said that the same word for Omain, for nation, body of people, political body of community, a nation is Omain, but then mine also means to turn or go aside, to turn into somewhere, in somewhere from the way or journey. So when you're moving along a road or the river and so forth, and you turn off mine to turn, to turn aside, to go in somewhere, mine, then you come into a, con a group of individuals working together that's in all mine. To turn off mine, a political entity, mine. That's what's happening in the nation. The same thing is happening inside the body. We have the river of blood in the body and so forth. It's moving along. And then it turns off of the natural or the regular road, the regular path. And once it turns off the regular path, it ends up in an organ structure or glandular stru structure, whether it's the pancreas or the spleen or the liver and so forth that you turn off and there's a collection of cells, entities working together all for a common cause. All of the liver cells are supporting the liver or the pancreas cells are supporting their parent organ, the pancreas or the spleen cells serving their parent organ, the spleen and so forth. So that is a group of individuals working together and omine, a nation. 
because it's in turning off or going into a different direction off the regular path, mind. So when we see the river of blood that's carrying nutrients to every cell in the body, it's feeding each one of these organizational structures, these political structures, these omai, these nations. So every one of the organs and glands in your body is a nation, it's an omai, it carries a certain function as it is to execute within the body, it carries a certain form or shape that's related to that function, and it carries a specific energy complex. Each one of the organs is governed by a different divinity, a different deity. And the cells of that, that organ or gland or structure and so forth carry the energy of that gland or organ, but also manifest the energy and carry the energy of that divinity that governs the gland. The same is true of us. As Afurakani, Afurakani people, we are cells within the great divine body of the Supreme Being. And we are children of specific glands or organs within the great divine body of Amen and Amenet. So that means a certain Nabosom or Orisha or Vodou governs the head of the individual. You're a cell and you're part of a parent organ. And when you serve your parent organ, you're serving the great being at the same time, the great body. So if you're a child of the liver or a child of the reproductive organ, the womb, uterus, and so forth, or a child of the immune system structure and so forth, you're a child of that parent divinity. That's your parent deity, your parent abosomo orisha. But when you serve that divinity, that you are a component part of a cell within, then you're also serving the great being at the same time. Now. So we went through that portion right there. Now, then we have further a further definition, ha or hapu, also hepu and so forth, just laws. That's the plural. Singular is hep, hepu is plural. A law, an order, a regulation, a restriction, custom page of a book and so forth, but a law, regulation, and so forth. Hapu, um, um, laws in plural, laws laid down by the learned and so forth, good law, justice, hep, to bind, to regulate. Hapu and hepet and so forth, that which binds or regulates, that's what is, uh, that's in law or in order or regulation. But hep means to bind or regulate. We saw that when the water is moving through the earth and so forth, there's a binding that takes place. Nutrients are binding together and so forth. The soil is carried and placed on the banks of the river, and there's a binding that takes place there that's laying down or binding regulation and so forth. And then eventually another binding takes place when you take the seeds and plant them in the soil. Then a binding takes place there. Then the germination of the seeds happens. The roots go deep down in the soil and grasp the nutrients from the soil. That's a binding that takes place in merit, but also hop to bind to regulate and so forth, and then sprouts occur and harvesting and so forth. So you see that law, laws, regulations, edicts, restrictions, prohibitions, the law. So there's a direct relationship between the divinity hop, dealing with binding, something that binds you. When we talk about binding, we're talking about binding ourselves to divine order binding our thoughts, intentions, and actions to divine order, tying ourselves in thought, word, and deed to divine order. That's hop, as well as mer, or merit. We saw I mean, the bandage to bind, you know, band together and so forth. They have that same function. So we see a relationship between physiologically, what do the river of blood, rivers of blood and body do, the, the arteries and veins, they send you know, nutrients and so forth and flood the body with nutrients, as well as you know, the nutrients in the blood, but also the fire in the blood, the fire energy of Ra and Raya that's within the oxygen. Cells are fed with that fire. The blood carries that fire to every cell in the body. So Hapi is distributing that and so forth. And Merit captures that harvest and brings it back to the 
right side of the heart so the blood can be reoxygenated, repurified, and start the process all over again. So we see that happening physiologically. We see that happening on earth with the rivers and so forth. But we also see that happening, you know, spiritually. Now, just like you have rivers of blood in the body, in that same pathway, you have rivers of energy. That river of energy going from the base of the spine to the top of the head and so forth, that same river of energy along the path of the, you know, the arteries and the veins, that river of energy is regulated by Hopi and Mary. They regulate the movement of divine living energy. Ra and Ra'et are the creator and creatress. They are the divine living energy that animates all created entities on earth. But when their energy penetrates the body, then Hop, Hapi and Mary, they take that energy within the veins and arteries and distribute that energy to the various cells of the body. And once again, Heru is sitting in the heart and so forth, pumping the heart and palpitating the heart and so forth, and how that energy flows, how strong it flows, or how quickly it moves and so forth is regulated by the palpitation of the heart and so forth. But Hapi and Mary, they receive the energy that comes in through the breath and, and you know absorbed and so forth through the magnetosphere, comes into the body and so forth, it is captured by Hapi and Mary and distributed throughout the body. Now there's another piece that's directly related to that, that's important. There are 42 sepatu or so-called gnomes or administrative divisions in Kemet. So, and we have the south um, at the top and the north at the bottom, which is the proper orientation here. So just like the United States has 50 states plus the District of Columbia, which is the capital, which is not a state, it's a district. Um, so that's the 40 or, or the 51st, but there are 50 states plus the capital, 50 administrative divisions. They have their own governors and so forth, but then you also have the capital. In ancient Kemet, there were 42 administrative divisions plus the capital makes 43, but 42 administrative divisions, which are really like states, each one of them had their own governors and so forth. So uh, this is where that structure comes from. You know, later in European cultures and so forth, they were copying off of our ancient culture, but each state or administrative division was called a sepat, and plural sepatu. So you'll see that there are 42 sepatu plus the capital makes it 43, but 42 states and so forth. There's a deity, and the, the Greeks call them the 42 gnomes of command. Then there are 42 divinities that govern each one of the gnomes and so forth, but the, the Greeks called them gnomes, but we called them sepa, and they were named after the divinity sepa. And this is the deity sepa. He was directed to govern the spirit body of Al-Sar, Ra directed him to do so and so forth. So he governed the spirit body, the entire body of Al-Sar. And because he governed the entire body of Al-Sar, the entire nation of the you know, body of the country, the country's body divided up into 42 administrative divisions plus the capital. And they were named after the divinity Sepa. They're the 42 Sepatu or the 42 quote unquote states. When you see the determinative symbol that represents Sepa, you see that it is the centipede. And the reason for that is when you look in the body and you look in this region, it is akin to a centipede sitting right in the midst of the chest with the legs going out and so forth. There are 43 pairs of nerves in the body. Those 43 pairs of nerves regulate the energetic force um, that moves and animates the entire body. So those 43 pairs of nerves, as they regulate energy within the body, akin to this divinity, sepa, it is like a little centipede sitting in the midst of the chest and so forth with the legs sticking out. 42 
pairs plus the regulating pair makes it 43. This is why ancient Khmer was divided up into 42 sepatu or 42 states with the capital making it 43 because that's how the body is governed, you know, physiologically. So the state is a replication of what's happening biologically. Now, let's go out real quick. And to corroborate that a little bit further, we'll look at our book, Coco Bo. In this particular text, um, the reason we wrote the book is a series of research articles. Um, of course, Europeans would try to pr promote this false idea that we accepted dissexuality, homosexuality in ancient Kemet because they are sexual deviants, perverts. But of course, that was never true of ancient Kemet or any other Afurakani, Afurakani culture, African Black culture anywhere in the world. So we were showing that um, in this, the first article, The Divine Prohibition Against Dissexuality, Homosexuality in Ancient Kemet. There's a particular text called the, four, often called the 42 Negative Confessions or 42 Declarations of Innocence and so forth. And in that particular text, there are 42 divinities. And you can see this is a section of that text. You see most of them there. In the hall of my out there are 42 divinities. So in order to pass the tests, when you transition your spirit before you become part of the ancestral community, you have to show that you lived in harmony with divine order while you were living on earth. If you can pass that test when your heart is weighed against the feather of Ma'at, then you will be allowed to dwell with the pristine ancestral community. If you do not, then you won't be allowed to dwell with the community. Just like if somebody was, you know, if you had a family reunion and the entire family was there, if there was some family member who was always, you know, doing heroin and stealing and, you know, engaging crazy behavior, because of their behavior, they are repelled from dwelling with the community. If they tried to come to the family reunion, they would not be allowed in the space, they wouldn't be allowed on the property and so forth. They would be repelled by the entire community because of the perversion of their behavior. When we transition, spirit leaves the body and so forth, before you can dwell with the ancestral community, your heart is weighed against the feather to see if it balances out the feather, if you live in harmony with order, if it's balanced and so forth, you can dwell with the community. If not, then you're repelled from the ancestral community. Now you become an earthbound spirit, one of these spirits that are hanging around the place where they were killed, the place where they died and so forth, and they're still projecting negative energy in these spaces. So when they talk about the 42 negative confessions or declarations of innocence or um, admonitions of Ma'at or 42 laws of Ma'at and so forth, what it really is is from this text. It is really an invocation to 42 different deities. You go to one divinity, you invoke that divinity, that spirit searches your spirit body to make sure you lived in harmony with that aspect of creation that that divinity governs. When you pass that, you go to the next divinity and the next divinity, and there are 42 ritual invocations. When you invoke these 42 divinities, just like you did when you were on earth, you pour libation and invoke these deities like we normally do. When you transition, you do that one more time. You invoke these divinities through ritual prayer and so forth. You align your spirit with theirs. They search your spirit out and so forth. If you live in harmony with that aspect of creation they govern, then you're allowed to move forward. The reason that there are 42 divinities, so it's not just 42 laws. It's not just like the quote unquote 10 commandments which were stolen from this particular text, but we're not just reciting commandments. We're not just saying, I have not done this and I have not done that and I have not done this. This is not a series of 42 commandments. It's a series of 42 ritual invocations to 42 different male 
and female deities. That's what the text actually is. This one in particular, we pointed out, was it states that Hail Kererti, meaning invoking the deity Kererti, and this is him right here, coming forth from the land of the West. I have not copulated with a copulated or penetrated a penetrator. The actual Medutu for that, as you can see here, a kererti per m amintet an nuk n nuk. So it says a or hail kereti coming forth per m amintet, coming forth from amintet, the land of the west, the land of the setting sun, and so forth. Not have I nuk nuk or penetrated, and you see the erect male phallus and you see the erect male phallus with seminal fluid coming out and so forth. I've not copulated or penetrated a penetrator or copulator. I've not engaged in same sex um, perversity. You cannot, that's one of the divinities, the divinity Kererti, who comes forth from the land of the West, the land of the caverns and so forth, the gateway to the ancestral realm, the gateway to the spirit realm is the Kerer, the cavern the hole, the cavern, the gateway, the hole in the mountain that you go through to go to the ancestral realm, but governs the caverns, the openings, the um, reproductive organs with the opening for the woman and so forth, the cavern, the opening to the womb and so forth, the opening for the male and so forth. So kererti, keret means cavern or opening. Kererti is the divinity that governs the caverns. The gateway, the womb of the woman, the vagina and uterus and so forth is the gateway through which the ancestral spirit who is reincarnated will come into the world. So that's a gateway, that's a cavern. Kererti governs the opening and closing of the caverns on earth as well as in the body. If you invoke the divinity Kererti, who governs the caverns, you must say that I lived in harmony with this divinity. You didn't try to go into a cavern that you should not be going into. You don't, shouldn't be trying to go into a hole or a cavern or a gateway that you shouldn't be going into. That's sexually, it also has to do with consuming things. Your mouth is a cavern. Are you consuming the kinds of foods or putting drugs in your system, heroin or cocaine, or you know, abusing alcohol and smoking and so forth? Are you putting things in that cavern that would create disorder in the body, the cells in the body and so forth? creating disorder with, your, with regard to your capacity to hear what the insamanful, the ancestral spirits and the abosom, the divinities are directing you to do? Are you putting substances in your system, in your caverns that will disrupt your capacity to focus and open you up to the discarnate spirits of individuals who couldn't pass that test and they're negative, you know, homeless spirits who are constantly trying to pull you towards lustful activity or perverse activity and you're hearing th these voices or you have these urges to engage in self-destructive behavior consistently because you're dumbing yourself down and dulling your cells with these substances, you know, alcoholic substances, other drugs and so forth that make you less receptive to divine order and more receptive and open to discarnate spirits of disorder. So, that has to do with the caverns as well. What are you putting in the caverns? What are you releasing and so forth? So you invoke the divinity Kererti and he will search your spirit to see, did you live in harmony? Did you protect your caverns? Did you live in harmony with divine order? So we were just showing that as an example of one of those 42 divinities. Um, But the key is there are 42 deities plus the judge of those 42, which makes 43, that regulate the spirit realm. There are four, those same 42 deities regulate the entire body of the nation of Kemet, 42 sepatu or states, plus the capital making 43. And in your physical body, there are 43 pairs of nerves that regulate every aspect of your body. Those 43 pairs of nerves, they are the shrines in your body for these 43 deities, the 42 sepatu um, deities plus the judge, which makes 43.
Okay. As we saw, so that that particular that particular you know there are so admonitions against stealing, admonitions against you know adultery, admonitions against you know um, you know negative activity, killing someone without a just cause. You can kill somebody with a just cause, self defense and things like that. But then killing without a just cause that's out of harmony with divine order. So all these different forty two divinities govern different aspects of behavior. So um, that was one of them governing the caverns that you enter into or block or you know regulate the opening and closing of the caverns. Meaning you could not enter into the ancestral realm in harmony with divine order and be accepted by the deities if you engage in this sexual homosexual behavior. So that proves that there's a divine prohibition against this sexuality, homosexuality in the text of ancient Gamet, it has nothing to do with Europeans coming later and Christianity and Islam. Europeans now saying that because we were Christianized and so forth, since there was a prohibition against that in the Bible and Quran, that our people got involved in that recently, but we didn't have any prohibition against that in traditional African culture. In reality, it's the reverse. This is thousands of years ago. There's a direct proof of a prohibition for everyone. Everyone had to go through this balancing of the heart against the feather. Everyone who transitioned must go before these 42 divinities. These 42 divinities are also invoked in life. So it started with us. Europeans are the ones who promote that perverse sexual deviance. And then they learned about, you know, being against the sexuality from us. They included it in their fake little texts and so forth to get some of our people to go along with the fake religions and their fictional characters like Muhammad and Buddha and Brahmin and Yahweh and Allah and, and Jesus, Yeshua, and so forth, these fictional cartoon characters who never existed of any form or of any race whatsoever. They couldn't force our people or get our people to go along with these fake religions. One of the things that they did was try to incorporate our cultural practices into their fake religions. They're the ones who've always pushed this sexuality, homosexuality, but they tried to promote a prohibition against that in their fake religions because they knew that would draw us to it. But then of course they promote that on a regular basis today. And that goes to the functioning and iconography of Hapi. We talked about Hapi being shown as a swollen man, a big stomach and chest and so forth because he's the spiritual force that expands or inundates or swells the river and so forth. Now, and one of his sacred animal totems is the hippopotamus with the big belly and the big fat, you know, and so forth. That's why he's represented in that way. The whites and offspring put forth the false and insane notion that he's shown with a big belly and a flabby chest and so forth because he's really androgynous and it represents homosexuality and you know, he has breasts and so forth. Of course, they're gonna to seek to promote that insanity to try to corrupt our traditions, but it's never been true. But to go further, because this directly relates to the cosmology as well, we need to understand the relationship between hibernation and estivation and nation building. So we know about hibernation when bears go to hibernate in the winter and so forth. They eat a great deal, they become swollen, and then they, they go into a hibernating state. It's kind of like a sleep state for a number of weeks and so forth. They're not moving, they're like asleep for weeks and so forth, and their body is feeding off of all the food that they engorge themselves with to you know become fattened and so forth, so they can make it through the winter. They hibernate through the winter. Bears are not the only one that have that kind of process. There's another process called estivation, and it deals, as you can see, with the crocodile here, the Nile crocodile in the mud. So what does that have to do with culture? The crocodile, sacred crocodile divinity, Sobek, is one of the children of Hop or Hapi. The crocodile is one of his sacred 
animal totems. You will find a crocodile called Odentium in Akan is a sacred animal totem for certain divinities like the deity Boson Pra, the sacred animal totem is the crocodile Odentium in Akan. The de deity Boson Afram, the sacred river Afram in the Akan tradition, the sacred animal totem or Achinebwa for the deity the Abosum Afram is Odentium, the crocodile. You'll find that Ajakpa in Vodun is the sacred crocodile Vodou. And of course, Sobek is a major crocodile divinity in ancient Kemet. And the crocodile is therefore also, because of its relationship to the river, is a sacred animal totem for Hapi. So although now crocodiles can live in salt waters, they prefer the fresh uh, water bodies of central and southern Afraka, Afraka in Africa, like all reptiles, the Nile crocodile is a cold-blooded creature and depends on its surroundings to maintain its normal inner temperature. It can be seen basking in the sun in cooler climates, but when the temperatures are high, it undergoes a process similar to hibernation called estivation. Just like bears and many other creatures, crocodiles reduce, minimize their heart rate and sleep through the harsh seasons. The caves dug by the crocs along the banks of rivers are cooler than the temperature on the outside. During estivation, the, the Nile crocodile takes refuge in the caves and reduces its respiration rate to approximately, approximately one breath per minute. The body temperature drops and the heart rate goes down from 40 beats per minute to less than five. In this state, the crocodile consumes very little energy enabling it to survive for more than a year without food. So you can see the crocodile blending in with the Nile mud and so forth, getting into a cool space in a little cavern and so forth. And then they estivate or hibernate for a number of months. Now, then we look at the swimming for the crocodile. Now crocodiles normally die for only a few minutes at a time but can swim underwater for up to 30 minutes if threatened and if they remain fully inactive, they can hold their breath for up to two hours, which as aforementioned is due to the high levels of lactic acid in their blood. They have a rich vocal range and good hearing. Now crocodiles normally crawl along their bellies, but they can also high walk with their trunks raised above the ground. Smaller specimens, specimens can gallop and either larger even larger individuals are capable on occasion of surpri um, surprising bursts of speed, briefly reaching up to 14 kilometers, um, eight miles per hour, 8.7 miles per hour. They can swim much faster by moving their bodies and tails in a sinuous fashion. And they can sustain this form of movement much longer than on land with a maximum known swimming speed, 19 to 20 miles per hour, more than three times faster than any human. So what happens is they withdraw from a space. They go into an estivation, quote unquote, hibernation, an estivation state. They go into a meditative state after they withdraw. They go under, they can go underwater and so forth, but they can go under, they can be underwater for over two hours if need be. But they become withdrawn. They spend time during that withdrawn period. They refortify themselves, refocus themselves, strengthen themselves, maintain a proper body temperature so they can maintain, you know, um, a, a balance with, with regard to their health. And then when it's time for them to come forward, they're strong, they're vi vibrant, they're purified, and they can move forward in a purified manner. One of the reasons we have our our hot pea metery retreat, and we call it hibernation. And let's just show that real quick one more time. We say it's the hibernation retreat. You take time out from your regular course of everyday activity, you go into a ritual space. You engage the abosom. We engage in ritual at the ocean, ritual on certain ancestral lands and so forth. But we also deal with nation building activities, workshops on Afro-Akani manhood, Afro-Akani womanhood, 
um, nation building, uh, cosmology and so forth. So once we leave that ritual space over that weekend, then we can go back into the community and take the things we've learned to impact the community in a positive way to engage in Amanie nationism, the purification of nationalism. But we also do the same thing on an individual level. Of course, every night you go into a ritual space, you stop your regular activity, you go lay down, you go to sleep in a dark space, no light, no sound, no movement. You go internal to refortify yourself, strengthen yourself, recalibrate yourself so that you, when you come out of that ritual state, then you can function and execute your function in the world um, with ease or with little difficulty. Positively impact your family, your community. We do the same thing spiritually. We engage in the ritual process. We go into a ritual space, pouring libation, ritual song, ritual dance, ritual chant, ritual movement, and so forth. So we can go into the spirit realm. That's a gateway to the spirit realm. Ritual song, ritual dance, ritual chant, ritual prayer, ritual movement, these various gateways to the spirit realm. And once we move through one of those gateways through a ritual process, now we're in this uh, spiritual realm, a ritual space. We invoke the Abosom, the divinities, the forces of nature. We evoke the Nsamampo, the spiritually cultivated ancestresses and ancestors. We become empowered. Our energy is replenished. We receive direct, wise guidance. And once we come out of that ritual space, after engaging them, then we can move back into our regular everyday activities in a purified, focused manner so we can edify ourselves, purify our community, build our community, defend our community, and so forth. So this is why we have that, you know, culturally, we do it individually. You do that every day individually. You also do it on a communal scale. For example, even tonight. Tonight is Awuku Adai. It's, it's Wednesday night, which is Awuku Da, Aku Ada in the Akan language. But every sixth Awuku Da or Aku Ada, every sixth Wednesday is Awuku Adai, which is a sacred ancestral observance. It so happens that this particular Awuku Da, this particular Wednesday, is Awuku Adai. So we go into the ritual space, ancestral observance for a specific ritual period and so forth to re-fortify ourselves so we can come out of that ritual space with the insomal for the ancestral spirits on a you know a focused discipline path. Okay. Okay, so I just want to go over one one more thing. We want to touch on certain aspects of the cosmology of Hapi. As shown in the text of Kemet, and then you have a better understanding when you read the text. Now that you understand the cosmology, you have a better understanding of what's going on. So one of the translations of the hymn to the divinity, the now divinity happy, and we're not going to go through the whole thing. It's, it's a very long ritual invocation, but you see these texts and you have a better understanding. So when they're reading these texts, these are ritual prayers, ritual chants, ritual invocation. So we translate as to adoration to the happy, so-called now, but happy, hail to you, O Hop, who manifests yourself over this land and comes to give life to Kemet. Mysterious is your issuing forth from the darkness on this day whereon it is celebrated, watering the orchards created by Ra to cause all the cattle to live. You give the earth to drink, inexhaustible one, path that descends from the sky, loving the bread of Seb, the earth divinity and the first fruits of Neper or Nepera, the grain divinity, you cause the workshops of Ptah to prosper and Ptah's deep within the core of earth. So he's, they're saying that the river hop and the spiritual energy that animates the river um, loves the bread of Seb, meaning the, the male divinity that governs the crust of earth and so forth, and the first fruits 
Nepera is the divinity of grain, the grain divinity. So when Hapi comes, bread comes forth because grain comes forth and it's all prosperous and the people can have bread, grain, the people can be fed because Hapi rises at its proper height. When your blood is purified and it floods your different organs and cells, whether you're engaged in you know, just regular everyday activity or you're engaged in ritual invocation and you stimulate that fire energy, your cells are fed as well. So it's talking about both on, on a, a mundane level and a spiritual level. Hapi is Lord of the fish. During the inundation of the flooding, no bird alights on the crops. You create the corn, you bring forth the barley, assuring perpetuity to the temples. If you cease to toil and your work, then all that exists is in anguish. If the deities, the goddesses and gods suffer in heaven, then the faces of men waste away. It says, then he torments the flocks of Kemet and great and small are in agony. That's if the river doesn't come forward, if it doesn't flood at the right time as it normally does. But all is changed for mankind when he comes. He is endowed with the qualities of noon. It should say noon. <clears throat> the primordial energy of root energy of being. If he shines, the earth is joyous. Every stomach is full of rejoicing. Every spine or back is happy because people can stand upright and so forth. Every jawbone bone crushes his food, meaning everybody can eat and so forth. He brings the offerings as chief of provisioning. He is the cre creator of all good things. As master of energy, full of sweetness is his choice. If offerings are made, it is thanks to him. He brings forth the herbage for the flocks and sees that each god or goddess receives his sacrifices. All that depends on him is a precious incense. So when we talked about the river blood moving through the body and turning off mine into a group of political body or mine and nation, and that river blood is feeding that organ, feeding that gland, feeding that structure and so forth, and feeding the cells within the organ gland and structure, the gland itself, the organ itself, is a divinity, and the cells are the children of that divinity. So Hapi is the master of energy, as the text says, floods that energy, carries the energy of Ra and Raya within the bloodstream, carries it to each organ and gland in the body. The way your different organs and glands in the body receive their energy, the major way, is not just being absorbed through the skin and penetrates and you know, fills up every gland and organ. You take a deep breath, that fiery energy of Ron Rat gets inside the breath and so forth, gets inside the body through the lungs. When the blood passes through the heart lung complex and becomes purified and oxygenated, then a heart sends out the blood to, through the left side of the body and so forth. And Hapi inside of the arteries and the blood in the arteries carries that life force energy inside of his, you know, blood structure to every cell in the body, every organ gland, meaning every deity and every cell in the body, plant life, animal life, mineral life, afrakani, afrakani, human life, we are the cells that are children of the organs, great-grandchildren of the great body. So the deities in this context are dependent on Hapi because he's the master of energy, meaning the flood of energy coming from the blood fills up all the organs and glands. In the body of creation, body of Amen and Amenet, the flood of Hop, the master of energy, as well as Merit, when she harvests the energy, distributes that energy to the various aspects of creation. Now, so it says, he is prosperous to the height of all desires without fatiguing himself, therefore. He brings again his lordly bark. He is not sculptured in stone in the statue's crown with the Uraeus serpent. He cannot be contemplated. No dwelling is there that which may contain you. None penetrates within thy heart. Your young men, your children applaud you and render unto you royal homage. Stable are the decrees for Kemet before your servants of the north. He stanches the water from all eyes and watches over the increase of good things. Where misery existed, joy manifests itself. All beasts rejoice when he returns. The children of Sobek, which is the crocodile divinity, the sons of Neat, 
the cycle of the deities which dwell in him are prosperous, no more reservoirs for watering the fields. He makes mankind valiant, enriching some, bestowing his love on others. None commands at the same time as himself. He creates the offerings without the aid of need, making mankind for himself with multiform care. Okay, and it also said, it is with the words that he penetrates into his dwelling. He issues forth at his pleasure through these, through the magic spells, talking about ritual prayer, ritual chant. Your unkindness brings destruction to the fish. fish. It is then that prayer is made for the annual water of the season. Southern Kemet is seen in the same state as the North. Each one is with his instruments of labor. None remains behind his comp companions. None clothes himself with garments. The children of the noble put aside their ornaments. The night remains silent, but all is changed by the inundation. It is a healing balm for all mankind. So they're talking about how the river, of course, the entire nation is dependent on hop, as well as Meri, their ritual incantations to Meri as well. That's on, on earth. Of course, in our bodies, all the organs and cells, dependent and systems dependent on Hapi and Meri. Spiritually, the river of energy in the body, all of your spiritual organs are dependent on the master of energy, which is Hap, as well as Meri. So let's let's look at a invocation, a few invocations of the divinity Merit as well. Pull this up. And of course, if you have any questions, you can post them in the chat room. All right. So you see the name is spelled Meret or Merit and so forth, different varied spellings of that. Now, one of the basic definitions of Mer as well as Merit is love or desire. Merit meaning beloved. Merit, Shema, Merit, Met. Beloved, of course, we're talking about binding, fusing together when there's fusion, when there's union and complementary balance. That's the definition of quote unquote love or desire and so forth. So mer means beloved, love or desire, merit, beloved. That's the title also, merit, asar, the beloved of asar, that's the title of aset, the wife of asar. She's the merit, asar, the beloved of asar. And of course, merit is the origin of the name Mary, being a title of our set when she's the beloved of Alsar and so forth. Um, and she's the mother of Heru. So she's Mary or Mary. This is where they get the fictional cartoon character, Mary, the mother of Jesus and all of that. So but Mary means beloved, is the divine singer or musician frequently depicted as twins, the Meriti, who may in turn be identified with pairs of goddesses such as Alset and Nebethet. Sometimes Alset and Nebethet take the function and execute the function or do a job that you see Merit Shema Merit Met doing. That doesn't mean they're the same, they're doing the job of, the, of them in a certain context, ritually. Merit plays an important role in all manner of ceremonies and her function therefore transcends the strictly musical to encompass all the harmonies and rhythms of the cosmos, arousing the gods and goddesses to action and accompanying their activities in a certain sense. Merit embodies the entire performative aspect of ritual. Now, they talk about the coffin texts driving off the Meriti, who are companions of Ra, who make healthy for Ra daily, but who also threaten to take away the deceased's magical powers or soul. To avoid this, it is apparently necessary to identify with Ra as well as to placate 
the Mereti or Meriti, as in the coffin text number 440. In that particular text, it says, I am Ra, I am the Lord of these two Merit, you noble companions of Ra who make Ra healthy. You possess what you have requested, you possess your joy. The companions of Ra, the noble companions of Ra that make Ra healthy. Merit is in the bloodstream, the divine living energy of Ra and Ra, that firepower, life force energy is within the bloodstream, being carried in the veins and so forth by Merit. So Merit Shema, Merit Met, they're above the heart, below the heart and so forth. They are the noble companions in the bloodstream of Ra's energy as well as Ra'at. Now, it says, you noble companions of Ra who make Ra healthy. It's Merit who carries the blood back into the heart and lung complex so it can be repurified, reoxygenated, and so forth, and sent out the left side of the heart. They make Ra healthy because they make the blood to be purified once again. So Ra, as well as Ra, can dwell within that purified environment. Now, there's another text. The corresponding spell in the Book of the Dead, which is the Book of Coming Forth by Day, interprets the Meriti as Urei or Aratu, divine fire spitting cobras dedicated to the defense of Ra, from whom the deceased secures protection by identifying with Heru, the son of Asa. In the Book of Coming Forth by Day, spell 58, a shortened version of the fairy boat spell, the ferryman asks, Who is that with you? To which the deceased responds, they are the two Meriti. So you need protection of the Meriti. They defend Ra, many the Merit divinities, Merit, Met, and Merit Shema, Merit of the North, Merit of the South. In the body, Merit above the heart, Merit below the heart, the superior vena cava, the inferior vena cava, the veins that carry the energy in their blood of Ra, they protect Ra, defend Ra, and so forth. If there's someone tries to pollute the life force energy by ingesting certain things that shouldn't go into the system and so forth, the fire is spitting cobras, the Meriti, protect the life force energy. The same thing happens as Merit. She's regulating or protecting the life force energy in the blood. They said Hop in that ritual invocation to Hop, he is the master of energy and so forth. So what they're talking about is the life force energy within their veins and arteries, within their vessels. Okay. Okay, so that is what we wanted to share with regard to these two divinities. Um, so the goal is to make sure that people understand how central, of course, if you look, just looking biologically, it doesn't matter how many organs, glands, structures you have, if the cardiovascular system is not intact, <clears throat> If the arteries and veins are clogged or you know um, malfunctioning and so forth, it doesn't matter about your respiratory system. It doesn't matter about your digestive system. It doesn't matter about the immune system, um, lymphatic system, or any other system. If the circulatory system is not intact, then everything else falls apart. So Hapi and Merit, you are dependent on them for your life. You're dependent on them for your well-being. You're the dependent on them for your capacity to function properly in the world. We just saw that Hapi and Merit, the entire country of Kemet was dependent on that flood to bring crops and you know abundance to the land and so forth. Hapi and Merit are the masters of energy. They're protectors of noble companions of Ra, as well as Riot within the energy system of the body, purified, energy moving and freely flowing throughout the body and so forth. So you have access to the abundance of life force energy of Ra and Ra to execute your function, 
to engage in kind of activities you need to engage in. Also to, to develop yourself spiritually. You can have blocks, just like you can take in foods and, and you know the substances that block your receptivity. You can take in projections from other individuals, you know, negative individuals living as well as deceased. And if you allow that to pollute your life force energy, create blockages in your life force energy, then you won't be receptive to the kinds of messages you need to incorporate to execute your function in the world. Then you become like a cancer cell wayward within the communal body, creating disorder along the path and also disorder within yourself. Because in her home, it's not the thing that's right. Once you went outside and ran him with your car, oh, so. after he had left, makes things so complicated. Unless. But Tina, what? Shit. Okay. All right. So we just had to, sometimes you have to hit the mute button. But so that's the information we wanted to go over tonight. Um, if you have any questions, if there are any questions in the chat room, you can post your questions in the chat room. So let's show a couple of things. That we have some things coming up for those who are unaware. And we touched on this a little bit earlier. So this is our upcoming trip to Kemet. And when you look on our page, you will see that we posted a number of videos from our most recent tour to Kemet that we took in May, um, at the end of May. And so this May 23rd through the 31st coming up, we're going back to Kemet, uh, 12 cities, uh, 13 sites in 12 different cities from Northern Kemet all the way through to Southern Kemet and all, all, also into Kanit, into Nubia as you can see in this particular video when we're in at the temple of uh, Ramesu and the temple of Nefertari in quote unquote Abu Simbel, which is ancient Nubia and so forth. Um, hold on one second, we have a... Okay, yet I say, yes, we will be, we will be posting it on, uh, YouTube. It's live on YouTube right now, but we're also going to post the edited version also. So you'll see all the information here. We have some spaces left available. Um, so you'll see we, we have about 13 videos, just short clips from the different cities that we went to, um, different sites that we went to, temples, tombs, uh, Meru pyramids, and so forth, sacred spaces. And you will see that you can secure your space with a deposit here, with a $300 deposit. And then there are installment payments, um, installment plans. You can make your own. You can decide how much you want to pay monthly. Um, the balance has to be paid in full by you know, a month before the trip. But you can make a deposit to secure your spot. But then you can make monthly payments. We also have, when you look here, the pay later option with PayPal, they have different pay later options. Some of them, for example, they have a new option for um, if you say you purchase or say you wanted to finance half of the trip and pay the rest of yourself, you finance $1,500, you can pay $75 a month for 24 months. So that way you can just pay $75 a month, but you've paid for half the trip. And then some people use their tax refund to pay the other half and so forth. But whichever way you do that, you can secure a space, and then, you know, you can make monthly payments. Hold on one second. So that's coming up in um, May, once again, May 23rd through the 31st. And let me pull up the Happy Marie page once one more time. The next thing that's coming up, as you can see on our page here, is our annual retreat. So we go to Edisto Island. As we said before, Edisto Island is one of the 
Gullah Sea Islands. Of course, many of our people were taken to the Gullah Sea Islands or ended up, you know, ancestresses and ancestors forced into these areas. But we go back to that specific land. It's on the ocean. It's one of the sea islands on the coast, off of the coast of South Carolina. So you're in South Carolina, you have to go over a large bridge and you get to the island in the midst of the ocean and so forth. Well, not the midst of the ocean, but you cross, you know, a river and it's an island, you know, detached from the mainland and so forth. And you're on the ocean. Hold on one second, it's taking a minute to open up. But this is one of the ancestral lands where our people were. Some people fought against the whites in Arrow Spring, established independent sovereign maroon settlements and defended those settlements militarily against the slavers and so forth, participated in the war effort to force the end of enslavement in the Western hemisphere. It is also a region, so you'll see, you know, some images and so forth. We have a video as well, um, a trailer showing certain things. This is actually an image from Edisto Island from 1862, so-called 1862, um, of our people there. There's a quote from that particular time when they're talking about um, in January 1862, armed African-Americans from the island and Confederate forces clashed and a Confederate raid and reprisal killed a small number of unarmed African-Americans. In January 20th, 1862, a group of African-Americans collected arms and fired upon Confederate pickets near Watts Cut. Evans ordered Colonel Peter Stevens to take 100 infantry and a company of cavalry to put down the uprising and destroy supplies on Edisto. And Stevens' operated start, operation started on the 22nd. But eventually, you get down to it. Stevens learned that a group of African Americans had recently attacked a local plantation and searched for them, um, eventually going to Point of Pines on Edisto Island across from Seabrook Island. About four former slaves were killed or wounded, including women and el elderly individuals, and about 14 were captured. However, res residents of the camp who were staying in the area had been given an alarm, and many fled before the Confederates arrived. And what they will talk about at the bottom of the piece. Since that time, he reported that contrabands, that was a title for those who ran away and became Maroons and established independence, Contrabands had been coming in constantly and were also settling on Botany Bay Island, one of Edisto Island's barrier islands. By February 3rd, Treasury agent Edward L. Pierce estimated the camps numbered 2,300, while on February 10th, DuPont estimated 8 to 10,000, and the risk of famine and disease was increasingly apparent. So what happened was thousands of our people escaped from enslavement they were raiding the Confederate forces and so forth, attacking them, going back to the, you know, independent, you know, sovereign spaces that they created. But there were thousands of us living independently, armed and ready and so forth, but living independently on Edisto Island, fighting against the whites and their offspring. So we go back to that space where we had warriors and warrior says the energy is powerful at that time, but it's also a time um, when you look at the uh, astronomical zodiac, not the tropical or sidereal, but the astronomical zodiac. And we did an article on this. Achinibwa, sacred animal totems, original zodiac signs in Kemet. And we showed the original animal totems, like Banebjedet, the ram divinity, where they got Aries. Patan Men, where they got Taurus, the bull divinity, Shu and Tefnut, who are the twins. It's not Castor and Pollux. Kepra, the beetle became Cancer, the crab, and so forth. Herubideti, Leo, the lion. Serket, the female scorpion divinity, became Scorpio. Ma'at, of course, scales of Libra. Aset, the Virgo. Sekmetisophiacus, the serpent bearer, the 13th sign of the zodiac. Neat is the archeress, so-called Sagittarius. Kunum or Kunrimu, the flat horn ram became a goat under the Greeks and that's misnomer Capricorn. Hapi and Merit. Hapi is the water bearer. He's pouring the water from his vase to make the Nile swell. 
This is where they get Aquarius, bring the water bearer, pouring the water into the river sticks and so forth. They stole that. And then, of course, we have Anit and Remy, the two fish divinities, the pilot fish of the boat of Ra. They became corrupted into Pisces. But Hapi and Merit, the male and female, quote unquote, Aquarius, water divinities, when you look at their time frame, the sun doesn't enter the constellation of Aquarius actually astronomically until February 16th. It's not in January, it's February 16th and goes all the way to March 11th and then March 12th, the sun enters in the constellation of Remi and Anit, which is so-called Pisces. So this is the reason why we have the Hapi Merit retreat during the time of Hapi and Merit. It's always around mid-February after February 16th. And therefore we have our Hapi Merit retreat during the time of Hapi and Merit. And this year is gonna be uh, February 18th through the 20th. That happens to be this year. It happens to be the same three-day weekend of the quote-unquote President's Day weekend and so forth. But so when we go to the island at that particular time, it's, it's not a great deal of tourism at all on the island. So very often when we go to the beach to engage in ritual, we're like the only, only ones out there on the beach and so forth um, because it's not a crowded space, which is good for us. So what you'll see is um, all the information there um, that's coming up. We have a few spaces left. We sent an email out about that. If you're not on that email list, you can send me an email to get on the list. But this is the, uh, we sent the email out about that yesterday. There are a few spaces left open for the Happy Mary retreat. We do have a, um, the prerequisite are these courses, these three plus either the manhood course or the womanhood course. Um, these are six week courses. Each one of these three courses are six week online courses, but they are archived. So when, when we were doing them live, six week courses, the cost was $30, but of course the books are free, free downloads. So the Cuckoo Tune Tune book that we wrote that we go over in that course, that book is a free download. Mata Nechi, that book is a free download. The Uben Shang book is a free download and so forth. The Manhood book, Obedima, and the Womanhood book are free downloads. So when we were doing the courses live, six week courses, they were $30. Now they are 50% off. So they are $15 each. So you can take them concurrently, but people who are coming to Hapi Meri need to be on the same page cosmologically. That's why there's a prerequisite for these courses, but you can, you can um, purchase the courses $15 each and you can purchase them at the same time or one after the other and so forth. And you can go through that information on, you know, on your own time. And the, the fourth course is either the womanhood course, which is a 13 week course that was taught by Ama Ma'ati or the manhood course, which is a 13 week course taught by myself. We have archived versions of the 13 week courses um, that are accessible. So those are the prerequisites. So you can get all three courses plus the manhood course, the womanhood course, and then you can go through them on your own time. But we require people go through that information before they come. You don't have to have finished all of them in order to register, but before February, you want to have gone through these the six week sessions of these different courses. So, but you go to the Happy Metary page. Um, we have about three or four spaces left available for that, but that is February 18th to the 20th on Edisto Island. Uh, vegan food throughout, and you see all the details on the page. And we just mentioned the manhood course. We are starting a new manhood course um, in a couple of weeks. We're finishing up the one we're doing now, a 13 week course. And the new course is beginning in a couple of weeks. So if you would like to sign up for that course, the 13 week course, uh, you can do so. That's the information on the manhood course page. December 27th through March 28th. 
um, right after the winter solstice all the way through you know, the spring equinox, that 13 week period, that's when the course be, um, takes place. So we have a few spaces open for that. So if anyone, other brothers wanna sign up for the course, um, it's 13 weeks, 91 days. It is uh, $91 for the course, basically a dollar a day. We go through the Obedi Ma book, Manhood book, which is a free download, the Patas Asatim curriculum, which is also free download. But then we also, during that process, examine 14 of our other books. And of course, all of those books are free downloads as well. This is the page where you will see our books and you can download our free books here on the Unhoma page on our website. And finally, we also have When you see the archive courses and you go to the page and so forth, you'll see that we have, we've taught 34 online courses. This is a collage of the various ones. Some of the courses were six weeks. Some of them were four weeks. One of them was seven weeks, but all the others were either six week courses or four week courses. Because they are all archived, they are 50% off. So all of the six week courses are now $15 each and you get access, indefinite access to the course. And all of the four week courses are $10 each. So you'll see that on the page. And then you'll see the flyers, the original flyers. So for example, we had the Bow the Seven Spirits of Ron Riot course not too long ago. We had the course of rest, the etymology, biology, cosmology, and divinity of race. And we go into detail about the divinity rest and reset. The male and female divinity of res means the South, but it also has is the origin, etymological origin of the term race. And we talk about the cosmology, biology, etymology, and divinity of res or race in that course. Um, the Ubin Shang, ritual, song, dance, chant, libation, shrines, talismans, offerings, all the ritual practices that we engage in. The Ubin Shang book goes into detail about that and their cosmological underpinnings. So we did a six week course on that book. This book, Uben Shang is the first book that I published. And this December 21st is actually the 25th anniversary of that book being released. So we have a six week course for that. So you'll see when you go through, you'll see the different, you know, flyers, original flyers for each one of these courses. You can choose whichever ones you want. We have 34 courses. Um, there and you can pick whichever ones you want and so forth. That's on the Akongwa Suiya page on the website. Okay. Okay, and there was a question, what is the best way to clean hapi and merit in our bodies. So the two major ways for that purification, ritual purification, the first of course is um, dietary. What things are you putting in your body? Of course, you're not putting things in your body that don't belong, whether it's foods or you know, smoking, drinking, any other kinds of drugs and so forth. It's polluting the body. It pollutes melanin, abatum and so forth. We don't engage in any of that, um, any kind of drug or mood or mind altering substance, including hookah or mushrooms or whatever it is that is polluting the body. We don't engage in any of that. So what you're putting in your body food wise or otherwise purifying that. And if you need to go through a fast or detoxing um, regimen, a good time to do that is coming up for the you know winter solstice, the name cycle of so-called solstice, ritual purification. But then also when we talk about um, susumho, meditation, also libation, cleansing the head, but you'll see, as a matter of fact, let's just pull this up real quick. Um, on the Onkongwa Suya page on our website, we did a just to show you this particular course that we go into detail about this information.
Okay, so one of the courses, it was a four week online course. So that course is an archive now, it's a $10 archive course. And calm, which means possession, but also spirit communication, four elemental rituals of spirit communication, practical instruction. So, Oshue, Nkomre, Susuho, and Okraguare, which is libation, ancestral shrines, meditation, and spiritual cleansing, soul washing, or spiritual head cleansing. These four elemental rituals, you'll find all four of these rituals in any Afurakani, Afurakani African ancestral religious practice, whether it's on the continent or in North America in the Hoodoo tradition and so forth. According to the language and group, they have their own names for these different things and certain ways they do certain things, but these four elemental ritual practices, libation, establishing shrines for the ancestral spirits and deities, ritual um, meditation, ritual soul washing or spiritual head cleansing, that's included, That's those are fundamental rituals associated with the four elements, fire, water, earth, and air, and so forth, um, for any Afurakani, Afurakani person. When you're talking about cleansing, the blood with regard to Hapi and Merit, and that energetic, you know, those energetic arteries and veins and so forth. But as we said, you know, uh, dietary first, but then also susu hum, which is meditation as part of that process. Okay. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and end it here. It's not, it's 11.05. So if you have any questions, of course, you can send us a message on um, Instagram or Facebook uh, or hit us up via email and so forth. You know, sit up. If you have any questions about the trip to commit or if you want to, you know, take one of, secure one of the spots or secure your space for the Happy Mary Retreat, or the manhood course or some of the other archive courses and so forth, of course, you can, you know, go directly to the site or you can send us an email, DM us, OGDAFO on Instagram, OGDAFO Akan, as well as Kwesi Akan on Facebook, OGDAFO on Twitter, OGDAFO on TikTok as well. So again, yet I say we thank everybody for tuning in to this special live on Happy and Merit and Yebeshi Abio. We will meet again. Heads up.